works uh, in that regard um, as a bit of a reminder now. So I'm going to share my screen. And you'll note that uh, uh, we had talked about last time how uh, there were these two broad problems that we're going to be pursuing uh, in, in these in coming weeks. We have been uh, pursuing uh, a number of techniques that fall into this area of parameter in, uh, inference, where we're seeking to take observed data about the world, emergent patterns generated by dynamics of the world, patterns that don't themselves relate to any one parameter in isolation, but rather result from the dynamics of, of a system as a whole. And trying to take that information together with model structure and reason about what that information tells us regarding the values of parameters within the model. The most basic technique in that sphere being calibration, which is almost universally I shouldn't say universally, but it's very, very widely applied. We're adjusting parameters to find the best fit, as it were. And it's subject to very simple, um, uh, simple analytics involved, uh, something like taking a least squares difference between the model's results and uh, what we see empirically in finding the, the particular parameter value that makes that, that match as tight as possible. But then we graduated to a Bayesian, approximate Bayesian computation where we were sampling from possible values of these parameters. Sampling that was uh, using the prior distribution um, as the basis and where we either in its most basic form rejected or accepted that that draw from the prior distribution based on the closeness of that. And that gave us a, a wide variety of, well, often it's wide, um, but in any case, a variety of different possible values of parameters. And then we saw MCMC, which took the, the ideas by approximate Bayesian computation, made them more rigorous, made them more precise by introducing likelihood functions. Where, and where we were sampling in a more intelligent, guided fashion, adaptive fashion, learning fashion, suitable given our exploration of machine learning techniques, and where it spent its time sampling from parameter values where they were, uh, where the going was good, where they had uh, better fits, um, where the posterior distribution was high. Uh, rather than using the kind of blanket, accept or reject, take it or leave it style of approximate Bayesian computation. But all of those are parameter inference techniques. Um, they have their, their uses. Uh, we'll be coming back to them. But, uh, but there's, when we're dealing with stochastic systems, we have a need beyond that. We have a need to estimate the underlying system. And I, I noted last time that even the best fit models in this area eventually go awry. There's, there's just too much darn stochastics out there. And we know our models are imperfect. We know they're terribly fallible. Even if they're formulated with the best possible evidence and great erudition when they're built, they may quickly become outdated because a new variant arrives or new public health orders are, are enacted or there's availability of a new, um, of a new technology, say uh, a, a new vaccine or, or the arrival of vaccines or antivirals like Paxlovid um, or new therapeutic techniques uh, for very seriously ill patients like remdesivir or dethamexazone for, for COVID-19. All of these mean that, you know, despite popular misconceptions, it's a fool's errand to expect our models to be, to be crystal balls. Rather, they're learning tools. And we expect to learn from them in our understanding, but we expect something about them learning for themselves too. 
And that's much of what this course is about, getting models to learn for themselves. And so while we can build a model that's calibrated as closely as possible, where its parameters are tuned to the best evidence available there, it's inevitable that it will go awry, that it will grow increasingly disconnected from observations in the world. And I argued like a, like a um, weather model, um, we have to be pragmatic and say we need to reground this model uh, as frequently as possible. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a reflection necessarily of the model not being a good model. It's it's a reflection of the fact that that um, new data is available to ground it. We can learn with it. Uh, I sometimes like to use the example um, before the pandemic. I would use the example for for students arguing that, um, that each of us has a very good mental model of how to get from our home to our workplace. And when we headed in, at that point it was every day to our workplace, um, we would follow the mental model and we would very reliably get to our workplace. Uh, for the first few days of a new, new work, maybe we use our GPS, but soon enough it becomes habit and we have a great mental model that will get us there. But it would be the height of folly to try to navigate with our mental model alone. If we were to close our eyes and try to make our way to our workplace, we'd surely end up flat on the ground. We'd trip over a curve, we'd get broadsided by a bus when crossing the road, uh, we would run into a utility pole, whatever. We would, we would end up in some in harm's way, one way or the other. We trip down the stairs or going up the stairs. Um, it would be crazy to depend on our mental model alone. That doesn't mean we don't have a great mental model. It means that it just needs to be supplemented by feedback always. So we're looking here at open loop models. And I noted that these models, having learned from data over time, uh, can then project forward or ask what if questions in a way that's much more savvy. They're clued in to the current situation in a way that's very powerful. They've learned about the current context and they've estimated the current underlying situation in a way that's very powerful. In a way that means our predictions aren't just based, at, based on what the model tells us alone, but based on a grounded understanding of the current context. And we saw that within this area, this area of filtering, where we have a stochastic system whose state we're trying to estimate based on data as well as model, um, there are three major techniques. And we're talking about the first them, common filtering. And I noted that it goes between an update step where a time update step where we're projecting the model forward according to natural model um, equations for the best estimate. And then an update state where we're correcting our estimate based on measurements that we've received. It's kind of like we're trying to navigate our way to work, we're walking and imagine if we could never do it with our eyes closed all the way, uh, and expect to survive. But imagine if every 10 seconds or 15 seconds, we were to open our eyes and peek. Um, that would clue us into where we are, might allow us to center ourselves on that sidewalk, might allow us to, to keep monitoring until the, the, um, the walk, um, walk signal is illuminated so we could safely cross the road. Uh, so we, we update using our model we, we put our confidence in the model during the update, but then we correct our model uh, projections using the new data when it arrives, whenever it arrives. And then we go back to updating. It's kind of like that peaking. We correct our mental model so we can stay on the state straight and narrow. And I noticed, I noted it in a way that's going to be really important today that in order to, to, to go through this process, there's a key component here in this measurement update that's kind of uh, hidden by this diagram. 
given that we have a model estimate from our time updating, given that we can run the model forward and the model is terribly fallible, it's incomplete, it has crude approximations in it, like random mixing, it's, uh, it could be outdated in some regards, it doesn't know the way stochastics will go. We have that fallible model, but then we have measurements, we have observations from the world. And those measurements are terribly fallible as well. Each of them is incomplete. We're not observing the full system. Each of them is partial. Typically, each of them has observation errors, misclassifications. Maybe there's a case of, uh, of the flu that's based on symptomaticity reported as a case of COVID-19. Unlikely to occur as much these days, but uh, certainly would have occurred in the opening month or two of the pandemic, whether in Wuhan, China, or, or uh, here in Canada, uh, where, where tests were, were rare and sometimes diagnoses were made based on symptoms. Um, alternatively, you have, you have many cases where, where uh, the state of the system, the total number of infectious people includes many people who are not reported, who are so they're incomplete observations or people who may have COVID-19 aren't picked up because they're taking their, they're, they're measuring their infection status with one of these rapid antigen tests at home and they never call it in. So the question is, given that we have fallible model estimates from simulating the model and fallible measurements, how do we square the two? How do we combine and get a consensus estimate that's the best of breed that, that considers both rather than just rolling up our belly up and using one or the other. Can we get a consensus estimate where we get something out which get, has better properties than either one? And this is what Kalman filtering gives us. And this is what the extended Kalman filtering for nonlinear models gives us. Um, so we, it gives us this way, this formal way of balancing what the model's telling us with what measurements are telling us and blending them together. And the key component of this is this gain matrix K, traditionally denoted as K. And that basically tells us how much to weight the measurements and put our, credit, put our, put our trust in the measurement side uh, the observations in the world, maybe it's new cases, maybe it's number of prevalent cases uh, of infection or number of new deaths or what have you. Or to what degree instead to give a lot of credence to the model. Both are very fallible. And the gain matrix allows us to characterize at a given time how much we're going to trust the model and how much we're going to trust the measurements. Now, you could think of this a little bit like walking to your office or heading to your office on a really, really foggy day or in a, a near whiteout from a snowstorm here in Canada. Um, the conditions are such the visibility is very poor. Our measurements from the world, our observations are very impartial, very, or I shouldn't say impartial, they're very incomplete, they're very limited. We're not quite sure where we are. Um, and, uh, and yet our mental model is also limited. And so we're, we're trying to square the two based on where we think we are and based on where our observations tell us we probably are, but really take into account that both are, are really fallible. Now, here's the interesting thing. Um, the longer we go on, the longer the time passes where we're depending on our mental model alone, the more and more uncertain we will be about exactly where we are. If we're going, you know, uh, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes with our eyes closed, whether we're walking or whether we're, God forbid, driving um, or on the bus, um, we may be more and more uncertain about where we are until we get a measurement. And so our uncertainty grows with respect to models 
and then measurements clue us in. And, and so often after long periods of time, those measurements are like gold. Whereas if they're occurring very, very frequently, any one of them is, you know, is, is, is not much more than, than bronze uh, at most. Um, so here we're, we're balancing uh, the uh, measurements from the world with our, our state estimate and correcting our understanding of where we are. And there's gonna be sort of drilling down again a little bit more detail there's going to be uh, some important quantities that will feed in to this gain matrix. One of the things that will end up affecting it is this measurement covariance matrix. How reliable are our observations? Another will be this issue of system noise. How much, how much to what degree is our system accumulating uncertainty over time? And just as if we were walking long stretches with our eyes closed, we'd be more and more certain about where exactly that curb is and how close we are to it or how close we are to the next street where we, we need to pause. Um, so, so here we're going to have several sources of uncertainty, those associated with measurements and those associated with uh, the evolution of the underlying process. Uh, and, all of this is in the context of fixed parameter values. You can calibrate a Kalman filter. As we'll see, you can calibrate a, a particle filter. Um, if you want to do parameter inference together with latent state inference, that's a rather nice thing to do. And it actually can be very effective. But, but for the Kalman filter, we have fixed parameter values. This is not a technique that is estimating parameters. It's a technique for estimating the latent state. And I did mention that if you have a parameter that's changing over time in some uncertain way, maybe it's contact rate or, or maybe it's um, something about the hospitalization rate, you can estimate that as part of your state, as part of the state that's being estimated. Okay, so I noted last time, this is for stochastic processes. It runs normally between observations. It's performed recursively. When a new measurement arrives, we don't go back and reconsider all previous measurements. We just update our estimate. Um, it, has, it has quite strict distributional assumptions, which are really its Achilles, foremost Achilles heel, in my view. And uh, fundamentally, it locally estimates the maximum likelihood um, uh, estimate. Um, it has these strong assumptions are, are pretty strong. It, has, it assumes normally an identically distributed noise affecting system evolution. We assume the system is kind of buffeted about by what's called white noise in engineering. Um, at, e at, e at any point, it's kind of knocked one way or the other in kind of a normal way that can accumulate into a random walk, a kind of random walk of, of system state. Um, and it also assumes normal noise for each observation we get, each measurement as it's called uh, at a given time. Maybe it's new cases. Maybe it's number of people who have died in the past week. Maybe it's um, a number of, of people who are currently, uh, currently infectious. Um, if we have that observation, there's a normal distribution associated with it that expresses our uncertainty about it, centered at that observation typically. And then it assumes linearizability as well. This is an issue I noted last time for, for models that are, it can be a barrier for certain types of models, like agent-based models, you can't linearize them effectively. Okay, um, and I noticed noted last time it takes advantage of some nice properties associated with normal distributions. Um, okay, so, uh, here, um, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the extended common filtering equations. Uh, where these come from is described by a reference that I've provided, uh, the reference to Gelb, Gelb's book in 1974, uh, which came out of work at MITRE Corporation, as I recall, um, and uh, which goes through a derivation of the extended common filtering. Um, 
Uh, but it depends on these assumptions that were noted here, linearizability and normality in the, um, uh, in the measurements and in the process error. And one of the things that students find confusing is there's a, several varieties of extended common filtering. Many run into common filtering and think it's limited to, to linear systems, but there's extended common filtering. But extended common filtering itself has several varieties. Um, in some engineering fields, we essentially treat measurement as continuous. So they differ in, is measurement discrete or continuous? Is it more or less ongoing or are we taking discrete measurements? In infectious disease context, we're typically taking discrete measurements. Um, and then the question is, do we have discrete time dynamics? Are we only updating um, in a difference equation sort of way? Or are we updating in a differential equation sort of way where we have continuous time dynamics? And again, typically infectious disease epidemiology, we have continuous time dynamics. So this is, is the combination that's most common, and that's the one I'll be showing you. Overwhelmingly, this is the most appropriate for communicable disease epidemiology. Okay, so I noted some, some uh, notations uh, last time that we'll keep coming back to. Um, I'll be switching back to this slide to remind you as we explore these equations. But something to bear in mind is that we're going to have two vector, two types of vectors and matrices to deal with those vectors that we're going to be using here. One of them is a vector that summarizes the elements in the state of a system. So for example, if we have an SIR system, uh, but it can be boiled down into an SI system because we have a fixed total population and R is just the total population minus S plus I um, quantity, uh, then really we have two elements of our state vector, susceptible, ooh, misspelled, uh, and infective. Um, just two elements of our state vector. If we had uh, a system which had a changing population, uh, maybe because we have um, immigration or we have deaths or what have you, then we might have S, I, and R, something like, like this one here where we have immigration coming in. Okay, um, so continuing, uh, continuing on, there's another vector where we'll have measurements. So these are the measurements we're taking over time. And it's a vector of measurements at a given time we can expect. These are observations about the world, empirical data. So maybe it's a observation of new cases. That's the first element. Number of infectives in total, the prevalent case count as it were, the number of people currently infected. During COVID-19, that was estimated by active cases for reported cases. And then maybe it's new deaths. Um, that would be three elements of our state vector. You'll notice that they don't have to be, they don't have to be states or stocks or, or compartments. Um, th they could be flows here, um, like the number of new infections per day or number of recoveries per day. There might be sums of some of these compartments. So maybe they are the sum of infective and recovered uh, gives us the cumulative number of infections, for example. Um, and that will be fine. Um, they, might, uh, they might in some cases be, be stocks, but they might also be things like fractional prevalence, the fraction of the population that's infected or the attack rate thus far. All of those are fine. As we'll see, there's gonna be a function H, um, H, oh man, <laughs> let me down, um, let myself down. There's a, there's a function H that maps from uh, the state vector into the, the measurement vector that tells us 
hey, for a given state of the system, S I, maybe we'll throw R in for a moment. Um, what, what would be our observation for that? What would be our expected observation? Um, that's this function H here. Uh, takes in a state vector and it's gonna give out a measurement, an observation, which we're gonna compare with an empirical measurement. Okay, um, empirical measurements will denote with Z sub K. Um, for those coming in from the states, uh, Z sub K. Um, and we're gonna denote our deterministic governing equations um, the things that govern how the rate of change of the system using F. Um, and again, going back to an example here, uh, F here would be like these two, uh, two values here. Um, M should be zero here. Um, I had a boo-boo including that. But, um, uh, but essentially, F is a vector quantity that includes this in its first uh, element and this in its second element. Okay, um, so it's a it 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 maps S I S I in this case into a quantity of this uh, and this in its second argument. It's a it's a vector valued function of state that gives the rate of change in S and I. So therefore it has two components, one having this value. So at a given state, SI value, it'll plug this in and get a number here, and it will plug S and I into this to get a number here. And, and that's for uh, I dot. That's what F is. Um, that's what this lowercase F is, okay, right here. The deterministic elements governing the state evolution. Okay, and, th and there'll be this alphabet soup of other things. Um, but I want you to note that N is the number of state vectors and M is the number of elements of the, of the measurement or observation vector. It's basically how many types of observations we have. Okay, each observation will be denoted, will be indexed by the number of that observation. K will, here will be observation number. Um, and, uh, and this will rise. So there might be a case of one, a case of two, a case of three, et cetera. And I'm not gonna get involved in the dog fight about whether this starts at zero or one, um, which is the perennial conflict between computer scientists and mathematicians. And I'm going to stay out of that said fight. Uh, okay, um, so, so let's, let's talk about these fearsome equations. We're gonna unpack them. Um, but first let's, let's kind of assess them as a whole. They're, they're basically three types of equations written here. The first is kind of the underlying theory of the system. This is kind of our, our model about how a system is evolving. Okay, we have some system its evolution is basically governed by some deterministic equations, but some noise as well, which is assumed to be normally and identically distributed. Okay. And then we have some observations over time for each of these time points denoted by, at times denoted by K sub I, um, which, which, are, uh, which are some function so those measurements are seem to be some function of the state of the system. Remember, capital X is the, the underlying state of the system at that time. So new cases, it's some function of the state of the system. If you look here, new cases will be, um, and we'll come back to this uh, example later, but new cases will be uh, given by, um, this so we're, we're going to have h being this so given an s and an i i could plug this in and i could say how many new up new cases will i have it'll be c times i over n times beta times s that'll be the number of of new infections that i expect at any one uh at any one time um so that's what what this is it says given the state i should be able to get 
some expected value for my measurement. And then I add to that some perturbation, some noise that's also assumed to be normally distributed. Um, so maybe, you know, I, I say, okay, there's, there's um, some, some measurement of, from the system of the number of new cases, it's 100. And I have some normal distribution centered at 100, which stretches in both directions with a standard deviation of five or something like that. And I have an, an observation here. That's the system theory. That's the idea of what's going on in the underlying system. That's not what we use to perform the common filtering. That's, this is not what we're updating. So you can kind of just know this is kind of the underlying theory. That's what our assumptions are about the world. It's an approximation. And in many cases, it's a very good approximation. What these lower components are that are labeled uh, here are, are, are the actual equations used in the update. So you can imagine a, a dotted line between these two. This is what we actually deal with. The actual um, uh, updates uh, are of two sorts, okay? And they're broadly this pair up here and these two down here. And this relates to what's going on at the time update. That's the lower two of those versus at the measurement update. That's the upper two. So these are the time update equations. This is when we're, we have no new observations coming in yet, or we have no new observations to deal with right now. We just run the system forward, run our estimate, that's the x hat of the system forward according to the normal equations. When I say normal, I, according to the typical equation, the usual equations, standard equations. Okay. Um, uh, but then there's something else we're keeping track of, this P of T. And P of T is going to be this, this matrix here. It's a process covariance matrix. And basically what it's going to ex express is our uncertainty about this maximum likelihood estimate that we're estimating. This is our estimate of the system, but we're not naive. And we know this estimate has a certain uncertainty associated with it. And that's what P of T is characterizing. It's a covariance matrix. So along its diagonals are the variance in this estimate along each variable in the state matrix. So S, it, it, on the upper left, it'll be the uncertainty about the value of S. And just, just down to the right of it in position, the next position down in the diagonal will be uncertainty about I. And if we have R to worry about the next one down in the diagonal, will be uncertainty about R. Um, and then there are these off diagonal terms, uh, which express uncertainty about SI or about IS. It is a symmetric matrix. So, so uncertainty about SI is going to be the same as IS, which is lucky because multiplication of reals is commutative. Um, uh, those are the same quantity. And so, um, so this is a covariance matrix. He's basically saying, how uncertainty are we about our state estimate over time? And it reflects exactly what I told you a few minutes ago. Imagine trying to go from your home to your traditional workplace, putting aside the fact that many of you are still working from home. Imagine going into your workplace, imagine that. Um, the longer you go without your eyes open on the bus, or the longer you go without your eyes open walking along the sidewalk or biking, <laughs> okay, I'm a biker and, um, that would be quite an adventure. Um, the, um, uh, th the more and more uncertain you're gonna be about exactly where you are. If you've just peaked, um, you're quite confident, even if your eyes are now shut, you're very confident about where you are along that bike path or along that walking path or on the bus. But the longer you go, the more and more uncertain you are about where you are. And so these uncertainties uh, accumulate. That's what this Q of T is. The uncertainties can be adding in, adding in. Q of T is going to reflect here. Oh man, I, I've got to add that too. Um, 
here. This reflects the process errors accumulation over time. How much uh, process error we're accumulating per unit time for, for this? Uh, how much uncertainty we're accumulating per unit time in our covariance estimate of the system state? So we have some best guess as to where we are, but we're, we have growing uncertainty around that in either direction about where exactly are we? Where are we in terms of side to side on the sidewalk? Where are we laterally on the sidewalk? Think of that as S and versus I, for example. Um, so we have some best guess and we have this uncertainty about that guess. Now, um, that is the time update equations. And we're just running that along as a differential equation. Okay, um, that's what this is. Now, what this set of pair of equations is, is an entirely different beast. These are our measurement update equations. This is our accountant when new measurements come in. This is where we have to face the music and we're opening our eyes, boom while we're walking along that sidewalk or on the bus, we're peaking. Now imagine it's a bit of a whiteout, the heavy snow is coming down. And you, you think you make out that familiar, you know, familiar street sign or, or, or that, uh, that telephone pole you've passed so many times or um, that uh, no parking uh, sign or what have you. You, you make out maybe a landmark or two, and that clues you in to probably roughly where you are. And, and you already had a guess as to where you are internally. And so now you've got to merge them. You've got to bring them together. Um, you're not quite sure you're seeing that street sign through the snow properly. You're not quite sure that's the exact telephone pole you're used to. And so there's some uncertainty on both sides. There's uncertainty from your mind about where you are right now if you hadn't opened your eyes. And there's some uncertainty from your peak about exactly where you are. Um, and so you have to do an update of your understanding, but you're also gonna do an update of your, of your uncertainty about your best guess, uh, how uncertain you are. If the day is crystal clear, and nary a snowflake is in the air. It's bright sun out um, in sunny Saskatchewan. Um, you will, uh, you, you, your uncertainty will be markedly reduced by your peak. Um, uh, by contrast, if you have a measurement that's very, uh, uh, that's very uncertain, you'll, you'll, you'll have considerable residual uncertainty. Um, at the same time, we will correct our best guess as to where we are. That's what these two things are here. This is correcting our best guess, um, our single best guess, our stake in the sand, our, our, our best expectation about where we are. And this is correcting our uncertainty about it or adjusting our uncertainty in light of our peaking. Okay, so, so these are our two areas. Let's go through and unpack them as it were, okay? Um, I'm going to start with these two down here. Um, uh, uh, so, so the two here, we have this point estimate of mean, and we're just going to evolve that uh, according to um, uh, to this this state equation here. Um, so uh, we're going to have a um, Fact, these are the factors governing uh, system evolution, okay? Um, this is not the Jacobian itself. The Jacobian is, is a little bit confusing. This, uh, this arrow is from factors here. These are the factors governing the evolution. So for our model, this is like, um, we, we said it earlier, it's like these equations here. Um, so it's a vector that takes in S and I and spits out the first element being minus this thing and the second element uh, being that. That's our, that's our F there. Okay. Um, and that just says how the system evolves. Uh, so given our best estimate of where we are, we just evolve that over time to get the change in that. So this is like a normal differential equation operating with our best guess as to where we are, X hat. Now, this is a more gnarly quantity, the second one. 
So this is a, the covariance in our estimate. It's our uncertainty about our estimate. It's acknowledging consciously and reflectively that our uncertainty has growing, we have growing uncertainty the longer it goes on. Okay, so what governs that growing uncertainty? Well, one of the major things is that there's this driver um, just associated with, I don't mean the bus driver, there's this driver for it associated with, with just um, uh, our, our, how good we are at, at localizing ourselves over time. And, and uh, also um, that's a, partly a function of our kind of wandering, our propensity on the sidewalk to wander, to head off in, in different directions. So often our, we have stochastics associated with our evolution that are going to contribute to this uncertainty in our position and our estimate of our position. So this is going to reflect, you know, our level of confidence in the model. If, if we're not that confident about our model, Q, ooh, sorry, will be much, will be larger. If we are very confident in our model, Q will be small. Now this, this, by the way, will come back for us in particle filtering and particle on CMC. There's the same kind of uh, zen of, of wanting to balance the uncertainty, how much um, confidence we put in the model uh, with confidence in the measurements. And there too, we're going to be, we're going to be very careful about how much uncertainty do we assume is in the model. If we assume too much uncertainty, the model will be, it'll have no self-efficacy. It will just roll belly up and say like, I have no clue where I am, um, just rely on the measurements. And that's not gonna do us much good. If we just, if, if we are, we have no self-confidence and we have no sense about where we are at all, our model's not gonna be doing us much good. We might as well just use the observations and, and guesstimate. But uh, if we're too hard headed, if we, we have overconfidence in our understanding and Q is too small, then we're going to be lending too much credence to the model. And when, a really, when, our, when good information comes in with the measurements, we'll toss it away essentially because we'll just trust the model too much. We believe and we believe too hard and we end up not being able to learn. So this is the balance. Uh, we, we, want, we want to have a model um, that has a degree of self-efficacy that, that has uh, trusts itself enough uh, to, to recognize that it can, it has some, it holds some water, but it can't have too much uh, self-confidence or we'll un undercut our ability to learn. So we, we've got to balance the sort of humility and um, uh, with, with the, uh, a need to believe in itself to get something done. Now, there's two other terms here, and these come about due to linearization. I, I'm not going to go into it, but basically it reflects the fact that, hey, if we have that uncertainty breeds uncertainty, if we're uncertain in our position and we have a, um, and we have a, uh, a propensity to wander, we, you know, we're, we're going to need to consider that interaction of the fact that we have, we're uncertain already and, and we may be on walking, you know, in an uncertain way around or the bus may be going and stopping at different rates and, and it just compounds that uncertainty uh, according to the dynamics of the system. Uh, for those who are more uh, more familiar with the underlying mathematics, if you have a positively Epinov exponent, if you have amplification going on uh, in these uh, equations here, it'll tend to amplify our uncertainty. We're more and more uncertain about where we are um, uh, over time. It's it, that would be a little bit like we're in the early stage of an outbreak, and we're uncertain about what I is. And that uncertainty gets magnified and magnified and magnified by the fact we're in this growth phase, right? Um, um, yesterday, we weren't sure if it was two people in originally infected or four. And now that's been magnified, you know, um, uh, day by day. 
in a way. So next week, and maybe we're uncertain about whether it's 100 people infected or 200. Um, uh, next week, uh, you know, 1,000 people infected or 2,000. It's growing, our uncertainty. Um, uh, is, is part of the intuition captured by these terms. Um, now you'll notice this F um, is a matrix. You know, may notice this transpose here. Um, F is, uh, is a Jacobian. It's, it's a linearization of these equations here. So to sort of jump forward and, 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 and anchor that a little bit, um, I'll just note that if we had these equations, our F would look like this. Okay, we have, so this is F, this is F here. F sub one is kind of the first line here. Again, you can ignore the M. F sub two is the second line. Um, and the Jacobian just says, okay, how, how, how quickly is S change? So the first row is how quickly is S changing? Um, uh, as we change, um, uh, at, how, how quickly is do, S dot changing as we change S or as we change I? And the second row is how quickly is I dot changing as we change S or as we change I? Um, and uh, this is our Jacobian, that's our linearization of this. It kind of says as we go off and, and we increase S, or we increase i, how much would s dot rise, for example? Okay, um, so that's the idea um, with, with this Jacobian. And for this case, the Jacobian would be as you see there. Um, I just take uh, this thing and I, I take its partial derivative with respect to s um, uh, and take its partial derivative with respect to i. It's just like we treat everything else as a constant and take its derivative with respect to i, and we treat everything as a constant for this first term and take its derivative uh, with respect to s. We treat everything except s as a constant, and that's what we get. So this is its Jacobian for, for these equations here associated with something like this. Okay, um, so that's what the... Jacobian is here. Um, and these are matrix multiplications. P is a covariance matrix, and we multiply it by the transpose of this thing. And, and F is a P is a, 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 a covariance matrix, and we, we multiply it uh, here times F. P is, a, is an n by n matrix, uh, where n is the number of elements of the state vector. And we multiply it by another n by n matrix F, um, and we get out an n by n matrix. And the same thing occurs here. Uh, the transpose of this is also n by n, and this is n by n. This specifies how quickly is our uncertainty about each of the state variables uh, increasing over time. That's what that 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 is saying, and it's reflecting our growing uncertainty as we grow forward. So this is this these equations for the most likely estimate. So I wanna um, ask people here, are there any questions about this? Um, are people feeling like you have some sense about what this uh, represents and the motivation for keeping track, not only of our current estimate, but our uncertainty about that estimate? Does anyone wanna ask a question? I monitored the chat here. Anyone have a question about this? Okay, I'm not, not hearing anyone. So I will note that if you're trying to struggle to compare this with, for example, MCMC. MCMC, again, is estimating parameters, right? Um, this is estimating latent state. MCMC didn't have to consider that 
the uncertainty about the state is growing over time because MCMC is used with deterministic models typically. I mean, it should in general be used with deterministic models. Uh, I'm told by statisticians who specialize in this that really that's the only time it's, it's legitimate to apply it. Uh, and, uh, and so we didn't have to consider that our you know, that uh, as we have time between our successive measurements, our understanding of our current position was, was, was magnifying. We were more and more uncertain because we, we weren't uncertain about our current position. We we're just trying to sample parameter values, estimate our parameter values. Here, we're trying to estimate the, the underlying system situation, the, the value of S, the value of I. Um, given the fact that we have stochastics, they're being buffeted about. And we want to know what are they? What, you know, we recognize that over time, we're more and more uncertain that our model becomes off base. And we want to use this data to clue us into the true situation. Um, so this is this way of estimating what is the true situation uh, in light of measurements and in light of um, model estimates. And we have to reflect the fact that our model becomes more and more uncertain over time because it has these stochastics associated with it. Okay, so this is time updates. Um, that was this whole thing here, the, these time updates. Now let's go on to the measurement updates, the correction. This is where, ladies and gentlemen, the chickens come home to roost. Um, this is where there's some, uh, some accounting to be done some splaining to be done, okay? Um, so, um, and uh, a lot of the most powerful features of the common filter um, and its most uh, important intuitions come about with this phase. Okay, so the idea is we have integrated up the system. We've, we've simulated the system between measurements. So we're at the cusp of the new measurements, just before a new measurement. We're gonna use this notation. This is again from Gelb, from um, Gelb's uh, wonderful book on the subject, um, X sub K minus. The minus means it's just before the measurement update. It's just prior to it. We have some belief about the state. That's X sub K. Okay, we, we believe something about the state. You know, we. We've simulated it forward and arrived at some estimate where we think we are. We've been walking along that path with our eyes shut, firmly shut for 30 seconds or on that sidewalk. And we have some belief about where we are. That's increasingly uncertain, uh, but this is our best guess as to where we are. Um, and we're going to try to arrive at, in an appropriately Bayesian way, this is a Bayesian technique, an estimate for where we are taking into account the data. Remember that classic Bayesian goal of going from prior to posterior. The prior expresses our belief before an observation. There is an observation that is made. And that's the Z sub K. And we're going to arrive at an estimate after the posterior estimate um, that's been updated by this new information, that's been corrected, been refined by this new observation. And here's the amazing thing, statistically, ladies and gentlemen. Um, by so doing, even though our observation is uncertain, even though our understanding of system state is uncertain, typically we get more confident about the, the consensus estimate than we were about either of those. It doesn't require either of, of those estimates um, to be super high, even if they're each moderately confident, even if we're very aware of the fallibility of our observation, the fallibility of our model, model guess, uh, the, um, it, we can arrive at considerable confidence by merging the two. Um, Okay, so we're going from prior to posterior for our maximum likelihood estimate. This is a point estimate of where our single most likely thought about where we are 
um, our, our expected location uh, along that sidewalk. Um, now, but to do this, to go from that, we need to take into account something about Z sub K, the observation. Okay, so we have this observation that comes in. How are we gonna correct our estimate? Well, it's, it's actually quite beautiful. We just, we, we know that given our best guesses to where we are, we, we expect some measurement. We expect some observation, right? And we, we expect where we are along that sidewalk or on that bus when we open our eyes, we expect to see a certain, you know, a certain store across the street, or we expect to see uh, a certain building or a certain road ahead of us or a driveway just uh, to our right or whatever. That's what we expect to see given our estimate about where we are. Um, and then we actually have an observation and we take the difference between the two. So to make it, to sharpen a bit, a bit it, about maybe we have an expectation with respect to how far that driveway is ahead of us. And we actually have an observation about how far it is ahead of us. Um, or to take this into the epi domain, we have some expectation of the number of new cases that we would have now from the model versus some actual number of new cases that we had in the last day. Or we have some expected number of people who are currently active cases versus the reported number coming from provincial authorities. Um, or some actual number of deaths versus the number that were recorded. Whatever it is, we have some expectation from the model of what our observation would be given our, our state. And, and then we have some actual one. We call this the residual, the difference between the two. There's some discrepancy um, between what we expected to see and what we have seen. That's what this is. Um, H sub K um, is, uh, it was missing from here, but it, it basically mapped from state into measurement. Uh, and it says, what measurement do we expect for some state? And, and, and uh, H here is the linearized version of it. But we're just applying the, 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 full, uh, the, the full kahuna here um, to the state to get our estimate. We're taking the difference between the two. That's our residual. And you can imagine if this is big, um, you know, if it's a big difference, or hey, our estimate, our, our model estimate is, has not been very good. It, it needs a big kick. It needs to be corrected. Uh, if this is a small difference, it doesn't need any kick. If we're right on the mark, if we're right on the target, we hit it right on the nose, then this difference will be zero and there'll be no correction. So the bigger this is, the bigger the correction. And not only that, if Z sub K is bigger than our estimate, it'll pull it one way, it'll, it'll go. If you think about this, this will be positive. We multiply it by this gain matrix, which will also be positive. And so we'll end up increasing, we'll add to our originate estimate a correction factor that will bring our, our, our estimated value of X sub K up. By contrast, if this were negative, if H sub K were much larger than this, um, we're estimating too large a value. This is negative, and this will tend to lower our, uh, our state estimate, uh, associated state, state estimate. So um, here we are uh, basically taking a difference in observation and through this uh, state correction matrix K, the weighting, the gain matrix, we're turning it into a correction for our state. That's the job of this matrix, K. Okay. Our, our, our uh, matrix that's called the gain matrix. So that's what's going on in this term. We're sort of, we're upping our, our estimated value, our best guess value of X. Um, if we're too low, um, uh, if Z sub K is, is greater than what we expect, we'll, we'll up it and, and otherwise we'll down it. Now, the actual direction will also depend on K. So there may be some of these that are 
if we raise the value of this, um, it would actually go down and, and K will take that all into account. So it basically this um, adjusts it in the right direction. Maurice had a question. Yes, Maurice, please. Yeah, uh, Nate, thanks. Um, so we're talking about correcting states, um, yes. but some of the some of the observations are not states, they're uh, say flows. Yes. Um, so how, how does that uh, uh, get translated into a state good, correction? Good question. So, so if we were to look at a, a particular case of this, um, uh, so, so if we were, if we have H sub K here, um, and let's suppose that our measure, that our observations are daily incident cases. So new cases per day, ignore the S there. Um, uh, in this case, H of X, this value here, um, H as a function of X uh, is going to be C times I over N times beta, uh, excuse me, <laughs> the, there's this S was meant to be, don't ignore it, put it there. Um, okay, there, there we go. Um, this, is, um, this is our H, right? So if we have a certain value of X, X is the current state, so it's a value of S and I, we can plug those in here and get a number of daily incident cases. That's exactly what, what this flow is, right? Um, uh, this flow, is a function of the state and it's exactly this function of the state. So that H, it's true that it's not just like this is, is, is in this case, not just giving you a state val a value from the state, a compartment from that state, it's giving you a function of this, uh, which is fine. Um, and uh, this will, H of, of X will be this value. We could subtract it from the actual number of new cases observed. That will be the difference in the number of new cases. And K, K's job will be to translate that at the current time um, uh, based on the value of this H sub K, the linearization of H uh, around each of the state variables, it will, translate that into an adjustment in state. So it'll actually translate this into an adjustment for the value of S and the value of I based on how big this difference is. So that's part of K's job. And you'll notice K's um, formulation here involves this linearization of H, this H sub K at the current time. And, and it's precisely this inclusion in here that allows K to do its job and basically map this difference in, in uh, observation into a difference in the state, a correction in the state. It's the fact that we have H included here. Hopefully that's, that's helpful. So this is a case where it's incident cases. It's not a stock. It's not itself a value of a stock of a compartment or of a state variable, but it, it can translate into, because of this linearization inclusion here into an, an, uh, an update in the state vector. Hopefully that's useful. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, just to put it another way, uh, because we have the differential equations, um, yep. we can estimate the change in the state because uh, we know that, yep. that the, the, there's a relationship with the flow. That's right. We we know that um, the flow has this relation to the state. So if there's the flow is the observation. So if there's a or excuse me is compared to the observation. The flow corresponds to the observation. So if there's an error in what we expect for the observation versus what we actually observe, because we have those differential equations, indeed, or or in in this case we know what h is as a function of state we know how much of an adjustment is needed to each of these values of the state vector, S and I in this case, to kind of, um, to, to, uh, to compensate for that or to correct it um, on account of this difference in observation. We know how much to adjust our, our estimates of S and I um, to have it better match uh, 
this value that's actually observed. Yeah. Now, there is part of it I haven't dealt with yet, and we're going to be dealing with this. Uh, if we had R not considered here, basically what this would be is H inverse, which would basically do exactly that. It would just say, oh, okay, the measurement is correct. I'm going to update my state and my new estimate out would just be whatever the measurement told me. Um, but in general, we, we don't have that situation and we have some uncertainty about the measurement. And so the K uh, actually balances between the two and that's what we're about to talk about. Okay, any other question though here on, you know, drawing on, uh, you know, uh, in the wake of Maurice's question, I'd like to welcome any question about what I've talked about before I, I talk about this update to the, um, to the uncertainty and then talk about two extreme cases to really understand what's going on here. What happens in two extreme cases where the measurements are really, really good or where the measurements are um, not worth uh, a hill of beans. No, they're, they're for the birds. They're, they're, not, they're not to be trusted. So any, any question about what I've said thus far? Yes, Maurice. Um, thanks, Dave. Sorry to be the only one asking questions. But no, no, um, it's I, what I welcome. I'm, I'm, cur anyone. I'm curious yeah. about. I'm curious about. Well, first of all, I, if 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 the state has multiple um, terms determining it, and and uh, I, I guess this is there's two questions, but they're related. Uh, you know, so you have a flow in and a flow out, for example. So there's multiple terms uh, yep. affecting the state. Um, and you have uncertainty in both of those, and maybe you're making observations about them. Yeah. Um, you said earlier that uh, you know there's a statistical uh, magic almost where uh, the the um, the update the, the the uncertainty in the measurement and the uncertainty in in the model uh, I don't know kind of cancel each other out and and give you more confidence. I'm just. Uh, I'm curious about why that happens. Um, sure. But maybe it's something you're going to come on to. Um, but also, there's this question. Of, I mean, I suppose the answer is the same. It's just because you have multiple terms, it doesn't matter. You just happen to have more than one factor affecting the uh, the, the new estimate of the state variable. Yeah. So, um, so with respect to this phenomenon, it's it's actually nothing about why sort of a combination of two bad things can make a good thing. Um, um, it, it turns out that that's a more general phenomenon uh, that we see statistically when we when we combine Wait. estimates of a given quantity. It, it doesn't. It's not um, privileged to common filtering or extended common filtering. We we actually see it if we have two estimates of a quantity. Um, um, let Let's suppose we were. Um, and I'm doing this off the top of my head, but suppose we wanted to estimate the prevalence of uh, diabetes in, in, uh, in the population. And so we had one sample of people, so we, we, we don't have population-wide data, so we wanna sample a group and we can measure the prevalence of diabetes in that group by doing blood tests and, and um, and we could do that, you know, with a group of size 100. Um, and we could count the number of people who on the fasting blood glucose test, you know, test below a certain, and th they test their blood gl glucose level tests above a certain level and, um, and, uh, and classified them as diabetic from that single sample. Fine. Okay. So that would give us an estimate of the fraction that have diabetes. Now, imagine if, if you then had that sample and you said, well, you know, um, We'd like to do better than that. Let's suppose that we got a, a sample of size 500 or say 400. Um, so we, we do a larger sample. Instead of a, 100 people, we, we do another one of 400 people. Um, now that one's gonna give uh, more precise numbers. And in fact, the, the prevalence estimate will go down by a square root of four. It's a factor of four to one, 400 people versus 100. Um, 
uh, square root of four, which is two. Um, so actually the, 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 the standard error associated with the estimate of the mean, the, the fraction that if diabetes would go down by a factor of two uh, in that case. Um, so this estimate that we get with 400 is better than the estimate with, with 100. But um, that doesn't mean we should throw the estimate from 100 away. In fact, um, there's a way statistically to combine the two estimates. Um, you know, the, the estimated prevalence we came up with with 100 people um, with the estimated prevalence we came up with with 400 people. There's a way to combine them um, to yield an estimate whose, whose uh, uncertainty is less than either one. Um, um, it's, it's less than the 400, it's less than the, the, than the 100. Um, and, uh, and in fact, in, in general, when you have these sort of situation, there's a certain weighting you do. I think it's one over the variance for combining the estimate um, of, of each one to arrive at a consensus estimate whose, whose uh, uncertainty or variance will be, be less than, than either one that contributed to it. And so it is with, uh, with common filtering. So if we have a certain variance associated with our process estimate and a certain variance associated with our measurement, we, we arrive at a combination where the variance is less than, than either one. Um, and, uh, and so that, that's a general statistical phenomenon uh, involving you know, weighting of, of different values that measure the same underlying thing. And, but it really comes out at a practical level with common filtering. I mean, you, you honest to goodness see the, the uh, width of your distribution of your uncertainty gets smaller when you combine the two estimates. Um, uh, it, it, it typically is gonna make you more and more confident about, okay, where am I? Um, uh, you arrive at an estimate that's better than either one in isolation, which is, is kind of a nice fact. Now, as far as kind of balancing the two, um, uh, you're absolutely correct that you might you might have to kind of apportion the the being off into to two different areas and uh, or two different state variables or what have you. Um, I would have to think it through. I've, I've mused about this in the past, but I think it relates to the notion of a pseudo inverse and projection and linear algebra um, uh, involved in, in this division here. But I, I, I think it, would, it might use the, the pseudo inverse, which finds sort of a, um, a balance between the two that, that splits it evenly according to some criteria. But I would have to double check my intuitions with that. Um, I'm not going to be certain about that until going through some of the derivations. Any other questions, though? Uh, uh, Samaya, yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, what's happened uh, when uh, we have a uh, uh, wrong in measurements, for example, in uh, measurement of covariance or uh, er measurement error. Yeah. Uh, what are uh, its signs yeah. in mm -hmm. our model? Uh, uh, question, right. uh, uh, next question. Uh, if we have uh, noises in our model, mm -hmm. uh, are the noises uh, fixed or no? Or not, good, not good please. question. A good question uh, in both cases. Um, Thank you. Okay, yeah. So if your assessment, so there's two places where measurement error, uh, sorry, where error comes in. Two, two cases where we explicitly take into account um, in our common filter formulation, the occurrence of uncertainty or errors. One of them is with this Q of T term, and, and that reflects our process error. How much error we kind of attribute there being to how quickly our uncertainty grows. Um, and you're right that we could use a value here that's inappropriate. Um, on, on the flip side, we could use a value here for R that's inappropriate as well, um, you know, that that says our covariance that we adjudge according to our measurements is, um, is, is somehow understating our, our um, 
our, our actual um, degree of, of error. So we're overly confident about our, our um, estimates from the world, our measurements, our observations, or we're over or underconfident about our process error. Um, the way this will come out is the particle, excuse me, the common filter won't behave very well. It will, it will tend to, um, to not learn. Uh, it will tend to, like if you say process error is very small and measurement error is very large, it will tend to like ignore those values and will tend to match them very poorly but, because you've told it they, they aren't important. But you may see it essentially not capturing the obvious trend of you know a rise in the number of infections. You may see, you could say, nope, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Gosh, I know some people like this. You know, um, I don't believe there's any serious thing going on, and and it just ignores the sort of um, clear, clearly what the data is yelling at us, which is you know a growth in the number of, of curves. Or you'll see it. Just, you know, if, if you assume that measurement error is very small, inappropriately small, and process error is inappropriately large, it, it again will have no self-confidence. As soon as it sees an error, it'll say, oh, that must be the truth. That must be the truth. I'll totally reinterpret the situation for that. And it'll just flip-flop around different interpretations based on the vagaries of what the data are observing, you know. On a weekend where counts are much different than a weekdays, so we'll interpret a totally different epidemiological situation than it does on weekdays. And it's just at the whim of, of um, you know, whatever the measurements tell it. Um, and, you know, that's not a lot of good either. Um, you know, we, we want a model that has a certain um, consistency over time, a certain... Um, a certain credibility in, in, um, in how it understands the world. We want it to have a salient, you know, uh, theory about the underlying situation that that has some, some persistence and some uh, ongoing strength, some sustainability to it. And if it's just always flopping around according to the data, um, uh, you know, how much are we going to trust it projecting forward? It's going to be it may be totally at a loss going forward. Maybe, you know, it just always grabs onto the nearest measurement and we say, well, what do you expect going forward? I'm not going to trust a model like that. It is, it has no clue, no self-respecting sense of what's going on from its internal dynamics. All it does is run to the nearest measurement and hug it. Um, um, and, uh, and, and that's not very helpful uh, for projection or for what if scenarios. So I want a model that has a lot of credibility. And there's a way I tested in a machine learning method called, um, uh, called cross-validation. So, or temporal cross-validation in particular. So you, 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 you run it and you get it to learn from data till now, and then you run it forward and you see how well does it actually predict the next two weeks something like that. And a model that is reasonably self-respecting, but it's willing to learn, which was really what we want. It, it has a degree of confidence about its own belief, but it knows its limitations. That should predict those next few weeks um, you know, pretty, pretty well. Um, uh, maybe it's the next month of data or two months of data from measles or pertussis, or maybe it's you know, the next week of data for COVID-19. But it should do a very good job, um, even though it hasn't seen that data, even though the data is being used to test it, it should, it should account for it well. Um, whereas if a model is just has too little confidence or too much confidence, it'll tend to, to do poorly, uh, typically going, going forward. It hasn't learned or it, or it hasn't any internal um, uh, uh, sort of validity for, for how to capture the dynamics of the system. It's just always, um, uh, always grabbing on to the, uh, to, to, to the nearest measurement as if it's the truth. Um, so, um, that's, that's a diagnosis and believe me, <laughs> professionally, I've spent more hours than you would ever want to know with filtering models, tuning them for that good balance. And you, you develop a, a nose for it that, yeah, this thing is underconfident, this thing is overconfident. 
it's it's an interesting reflection of of how you want students to be, right? You you want them to have a certain degree of confidence enough to believe in themselves enough to to push forward, believe in themselves enough to uh, really apply themselves, but also to be able to to learn and and be corrected when their understanding is off base. It it affects you know it's for all of us because we're all students um, in this regard. Anyway, off my philosophy soapbox and and back into the salt mines here. Um, okay, so, so this is our correction uh, for state estimate. Um, the other correction occurs for the uh, for our estimate of the uncertainty. And remember P of K, is this how much we're uncertain, the point around X of K. And as you might expect, this can be expected to decrease for for measurements. When we have a measurement, it's like opening our eyes, we're walking along that sidewalk, we open our eyes, it's, oh, oh man, um, um, so I'm that far along or I'm, I, I haven't even gotten there yet. And so it, it narrows our estimate. Um, and so there's this minus term here. Um, now, uh, it turns out how much it narrows its est uh, our estimate is, is something that depends on this gain matrix. It depends on how much we trust our measurement. If, if the measurement is a perfect uh, fidelity, if it's perfect accuracy, then, um, then here uh, K will be equal to actually uh, H inverse, and this thing will be zero. And, uh, and, and so we'll have our estimate go to zero, be zero times this. By contrast, if um, uh, R is really, really large, we'll only have a very, in other words, if, if we have very poor measurements, uh, this thing will be uh, a, a value that's um, quite small and we'll, we'll actually retain most of our uncertainty. So the key thing that we're going to be dealing with here is this weighting matrix, uh, this K matrix. This is the key thing that tells us how much to trust uh, our pre-existing estimates versus our corrections. And it also translates those uh, differences in observations into the, uh, into the sphere of, uh, of state, uh, state corrections. Um, so this uh, state correction matrix, um, uh, is, is this gain, it's called the gain matrix. Um, and it balances the trust in the observations versus the model. And there's some things that I want to point out to you from here, um, which is that K, uh, if, if R goes to zero, if, if you can imagine this term going away, K is then P uh, uh, H transpose over H P times H transpose. At the R is very, imagine that being very, 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 very small. These two terms, this term in the denominator dominates. So it's this over this. And basically it's like H, um, H inverse here. Now this capital H matrix is the linearization. It says, how does this measurement, this value measure that we expect to be measured change with state variables? Um, how much of it is from S versus how much of it is from I? How much of that value in the number of new cases is contributed by the value of i versus the value of s? Right where we are now for the current value of s and the current value of i at our current state estimate. Um, that's that's what, um, what what this is. Uh, and uh, and again, if 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 we have that situation, this will go to zero, and basically our after our measurement, we'll say. If 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 uh, if we have super accurate measurements, if our observations are always on the money, we'll just have zero observation, zero uncertainty after it. Uh, and similarly, it turns out that we'll throw away this and we'll just use whatever the measurement is telling us. So in that case, and you can run through the sort of math here, but basically, we'll just take whatever the measurement is, and we'll turn it into our state measurement. We'll take the measurement of new cases, say, or measurement of new cases and new deaths, and we'll turn that into the best matching state states that, 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 that are implied by that. 
I'll map it back to the state domain. Um, and uh, per my comment to Maurice, I think this turns into the pseudo inverse uh, when this is not directly, um, when this is singular, but uh, I'd have to double check that. Um, so this will take that observation and, and just say, yes, ma'am, um, I will, that observation is, is the ground truth. That's like uh, the, the understanding of the situation. It's like observing where you are on a perfectly clear day. It's like, oh, I'm at that place in the sidewalk. Okay, I know exactly where I am. We just throw away our previous estimate of where we were, which was way off, and we, we just use whatever, whatever um, uh, is implied by our, our uh, observation Z sub K. That's what this is. So uh, H is evaluated at the current estimate of where we are. Um, uh, and then we'll, we'll use that to sort of uh, listen to what Z sub K tells us, the observations tell us, and we'll use that as our, as our new position. Notice that this linearization is taken at our guess of where we are. That's not necessarily accurate. Um, it's S and I where we thought we'd be. But um, it gives us a way of turning that observation into an actual S state estimate. Um, OK, but what does it do? So if R is equal to 0, if, if we have perfect measurements, perfect observations from the world, what does that do to P sub K? Well, you unpack it, and it turns this whole thing turns into 0 this thing here, and so P sub K goes to zero. This whole thing, this becomes I, uh, the identity matrix, because K is the inverse of H. And so this whole thing turns the identity matrix, the identity minus identity turns to zero, and so we just make it zero, boom. And so we'll have no uncertainty anymore. Um, so, so that's a situation where, hey, we have, we have really, really accurate error. This is basically zero. Um, uh, then we just trust the measurements. Every time there's a measurement, it's like God spoke with us. We, okay, whatever it is. Uh, uh, that's the situation I'll assume from now on. And uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go forward with that. And our uncertainty has gone to zero. Um, how about when our measurements are shoddy? How about, um, how about when we can't trust those voices we've heard? What if, what if, um, uh, what if you know we? It's in the middle of a whiteout snowstorm outside. We peak, but but um, we can't see anything out. Um, if if the observations are far less accuracy than the model, um, it, it turns out if you plug this in, you can imagine here, right? Um, uh, this is going to infinity. And so the limit of, of K over something finite over something going to infinity is zero. Um, the, the denominator is going to infinity, the numerator is something finite. So the limit of this is, is zero. Um, so uh, this X of K, uh, the K is gonna be zero here. So what this is gonna say is that for our new estimate of our state, if our measurements aren't worth a hill of beans, if they're totally useless, um, we'll just use our old estimate of what we were, uh, where we were. Well, this, this one, this correction, um, we don't trust it. Well, we just trust our, our model much more than we, than we do our, our measurement error. Our measurement error is, is, is so high that we'll just, are better off depending on what our understanding of the situation. Um, uh, and as far as our uncertainty, well, in this case, basically K is zero. So this will become zero. And this will just be I times P of K minus one, uh, uh, P of K before the observation. And so basically our, our, our uncertainty about our estimate stays the same. Uh, before and after the observation, because we didn't consider the observation. We, we tossed it away. We said, look, this observation is for the birds. I'm not going to listen to it. I'm just going to listen to the, to the model. Um, so you're in that snowstorm. Uh, you're, 
you have a pretty good mental model of where you are. You're halfway home. You're pretty sure. And you're just going to continue on that sidewalk, even if when you look, you know, you see white all around you, you can't see anything. Um, uh, it's as if you didn't make an observation. It's, it's uh, you've just got more slogging to do. And yes, you're increasingly uncertain about where you are exactly, but, um, but it's better than, than, than any information you can get from your observations. Um, so this is, these are the sort of two, two extremes this is uh, evolving between. One where we have perfect measurements and we just trust whatever the measurements tell us and translate it back into state terms uh, and our uncertainty goes to zero after the measurements or a situation where the measurements are worthless and we basically don't update our state estimate at all when we get one and we don't update our sense of uncertainty when we get one. Um, okay, um, so, you know, for a, uh, for an actual model here, imagine an SIR model. Um, we could turn that, in this case, uh, if we imagine no immigration, we have, uh, we have closed population, we could turn it into a SI model because recovered is just N minus S minus I. Um, uh, the extended Coleman filter equations then um, can be formulated F here or F here. Um, is just these, we saw that again, ignore the M. Um, and, and now we could consider the linearization of F here. Um, so we have these terms, we just linearize it. We get this as our Jacobian, or that's the linearization of this state evolution term saying how quickly the rate of change in each state variable will change as we change each value of X. Um, that, that gives us this, this uh, matrix. Um, and, uh, and then we have to, the other component, that was our, that was our uh, so we specified lowercase f, we specified capital F, um, the linearization of that at the current point. The value of this will change depending on what state we're at. If we're at a, a value of S equals zero and I equals a thousand, the value of this matrix will be different than if I equals 10 and S is 990. So in general, this will be a matrix whose value will depend on the current state. Um, but we need to specify Q, how quickly uncertainty accumulates for um, uncertainty with respect to our state measurement. And we might say, well, okay, we'll assume modest growth and uncertainty on a per day basis. Um, our uncertainty about S and I will grow for each of those independently by 0.5. So every two days we'll be, we'll have a, a vari our variance will grow by one in each of S and I. So that'll be a very modest growth. Um, and this is going to contribute to this covariance matrix. It'll, it'll contribute to how quickly our uncertainty about S and I is growing over time. In general, per Sommelier's question, we would tune this to have the particle filtering behave well. You notice for simplicity, I made these off diagonal terms zero. Off diagonal terms will be contributed typically by, um, uh, by by these uh, these two terms could contribute. One of them could contribute off diagonal terms. Uh, if I, yes, that's right. Um, what, what could, or both actually could contribute off diagonal terms. Okay, now, now let's look at the measurement model. For this case, we want a measurement, a measurement function. We use this one here. So suppose we have daily incident cases. We see times I over N times beta times S. That was just from this. This is the daily incident cases. Uh, I could have actually just said, suppose observations were instead of the number of people currently infective, in which case H of X would have just been I. Or maybe it's the number of um, people recovering, in which case I could say it's I over duration infective or I over mu. Uh, I could have all three of them. 
Um, but for now, we just said m equals one. We just have a single observation. We'll just make it this. Um, but in general, we could have more. And they might be values of stocks of, of the state variables, these compartments, or they might be sums of them, or they might be divisions of them, or they might be um, uh, flows between them. Uh, all of those will be taken into account by the by the equations uh, h of x and its linearization capital H. Okay, so m here is one, um, and f here, or sorry, capital H will be of of size m cross n. M is the number of observations, so we'll have one row, and it will have n, the number of state variables, two. It will have two columns, and this is what it is. This is our h of x. This says, given the state, what, what is our measurement? We only have one of them. And so the linearization of this with respect to s and i is given by this. Um, so that's our linearization capital H here. And that will be used in the gain matrix here. Um, now we have to have some sort of measurement error here. Um, and uh, the measurement error um, will need to be a single number because we just have what observation. It's a, it's a covariance matrix with a single entry. Um, and I'll say, well, it has a variance of two about it, each measurement, um, which is a quite precise measurement if it's a larger number of, um, of uh, daily reported cases, say 100. This would be a very, very precise measurement. Um, OK, so this is an example of that. From those, you could figure out what, um, at any one time, P times H transpose is, uh, and you could sum in R. Uh, with respect to Samia's question earlier, Q of T, I've specified here as fixed, but it could in general vary over time. And R of T could in fact vary over time. Um, uh, so we could have this be something which, you know, is, um, uh, it, grow, it becomes tighter for example, over time as our testing protocols rise or becomes looser over time as uh, we're testing less or as uh, what have you. So in general, those can vary um, based on uh, the, the, um, on the course of time. Um, I don't think that they could vary. Yeah, that it would be problematic in a generalization if they vary based on state. Um, because they'd have to vary based on estimated state. Okay, so we've seen Kalman filtering. I've tried to give you a bit of a um, uh, kind of an intuition for this with the intuition being that we have a, uh, a balance specified by this gain matrix between trusting measurements that is observations from the world and trusting model projections. There are times where we trust our model more. For example, if it's right after a measurement, um, uh, we, our model estimate might be quite good um, and it might have quite small uncertainty associated with it. If we are getting measurements very frequently, therefore we might be really listening to the model estimate because it's being constantly corrected. And if a new measurement comes in, we'll, we'll say, hmm, how does that square with our pretty good model estimate that's already been informed recently? If this measurement is really an outlier, we might be tempted to put it aside. Um, by contrast, if it's been a really long time since we've seen a measurement, um, in our equations, the the Q of T will have really accumulated. It's like we've walked a long period of time without opening our eyes. We're really hungry for a good measurement, hungry for a measurement. And many measurements will improve, will make us less uncertain. So this gain matrix is what 
balances between the two over time. Um, this will tend to become larger. This will tend to become larger. And we will tend to have, therefore, uh, a value of k, which is growing towards uh, really weighting more highly our measurements, listening to our measurements. Um, by contrast, if our uncertainty about our measurements is very, very high relative to this, and we have a good value of the um, um, uh, great confidence in the model estimates, then k will tend to be very, very low and we'll tend to trust the model. This will be close to zero and we'll tend to trust the model more and we'll tend to do little correction on the model uncertainty. So those are the two, uh, two cases we saw as R goes to zero, R goes to infinity. Um, so the Colbert filter is a powerful technique. It's a technique whose power is, is testified to by its inclusion in countless systems all around us, in our smartphones, in our GPS systems, in our vehicles, in airplanes, uh, in rockets taking off from Mars or, or further, um, in the Apollo computers. Uh, it's, it's ubiquitous. Uh, the, the Kalman filter is uh, a key component of our computational infrastructure and a key element of the data science ecosystem and one of, of great venerability. But for communicable disease models, um, it, um, it has a balance between economy and uh, accuracy that is somewhat off kilter uh, within communicable disease epidemiology. Unlike uh, the Apollo computers or your navigation system on your car, um, there's, um, uh, there's longer times between observations. For a vehicle, it may behoove us to be able to estimate several times a second something with a Kalman filter about where we think we are and what the GP, latest GPS measurement is telling us and et cetera. Um, we might be getting GPS measurements in every few seconds. Um, with uh, navigation systems on a plane, maybe maybe we're getting uh, new readings in uh, from from a variety of sensors. You know, every many times a second, um, and we need a computationally very efficient tool. And the Kalman filter is exceptionally efficient, exceptionally computationally um, frugal, and it really fits the bill very well. Um, but in epidemiology, we might have uh, days between measurements. Um, we might have uh, weeks between others, uh, perhaps months. Um, and uh, what the Kalman filter has in terms of efficiency, it has sacrificed in terms of generality. This assumption of normality can be a real problem. Uh, for epidemiological models. Uh, we, we, our measurements from the world are rarely normal. For new cases, a normal, a normal assumption about error for number of new cases would suggest there's some non-zero error of the actual number of new cases being below zero because um, normal distributions stretch infinitely far in each direction. Uh, our assumption about normality in system evolution can also be quite far off in some cases. Um, uh, also, this need for linearizability can present uh, a real challenge. More, more fundamentally yet though, in a nonlinear context, we have to deal with basins of attraction. Um, the common filter um, has been generalized for nonlinear systems by linearization. We linearize about our current best estimate for where we are. But what if our current best estimate for where we are is increasingly itself off base? Then that would suggest our linearization is off base. Um, it would be like uh, you know, our entire coordinate system being thrown in error as we're trying to walk to our office. Um, uh, our, 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 
understanding of which direction is which uh, has been thrown into jeopardy. Um, and uh, our understanding of what the, uh, the rate of changes uh, of the very dynamics of the system will be thrown off because our current estimate is off. And because our understanding of where the system is going is off, we'll, uh, we'll be further and further off in our understanding about where we are right now, what the current state is, and that will further the problem. And this is a real problem with common, filter, with common filtering. If you have multiple basins of attraction and you think you're in one basin of attraction, you're actually in the other. Uh, this, this, for a, a sample model, which um, with uh, uh, infectious disease dynamics, where you can have a system which has two basins of attraction, uh, one with higher endemic equilibrium, one with smaller endemic equilibrium or, or a stable system. Um, if you think you're in one system and you're actually the other, you'll be trying to interpret the data based on where you are erroneously, foundationally erroneously, weighing the measurements versus your, your, uh, uh, your estimates from the system in ways that are, that are off base. Um, and we could be in entirely the wrong basin of attraction. And our whole understanding of our maximum likelihood estimate and our uncertainty is based on flawed premises uh, of where we are, based on these linearizations of our measurement model and our, our um, model for evolving the system, which are, are uh, using bogus estimates for our position. So for these systems, uh, we can gain a a uh, more measured balance, a more uh, appropriate balance for many cases between uh, computational efficiency on the one hand and robustness and generality the other by making use of some of these other uh, filtering techniques, other latent inference techniques beyond the Kalman filter. Kalman filter can be great when you have frequent measurements, and we've found it can be very accurate in, in many cases um, under the, in the context of frequent estimates. But particle filtering and particle MCMC offer that extra power, that extra generality for certain types of contexts. And we're going to be taking them on uh, starting Friday. So uh, common filtering, uh, key approach, uh, very valuable still, um, and one which um, still has, you know, very important places and certain types of needs and certain, certain um, uh, epidemiological contexts where data is, is very frequent, uh, such as with social media data uh, or data from smartphones, for example, smartphone-based sensing, um, where you're getting measurement on an ongoing basis. But we'll be, we'll be graduating to see how particle filtering and particle MCMC offer some additional generality within the next, uh, the next two weeks, uh, basically, of lectures, the next four lectures or so. And we'll be doing deep dives into them. OK, um, so that's uh, all for today. I'm glad to answer questions uh, for office hours here. And I'll look forward to. Um, uh, to seeing you, uh, those of you next time. Yeah, I tried to give that a final example for the common filter. Thanks. Uh, hopefully that's, uh, that's useful. And if people would like to see it actually applied, um, I do have uh, an example which one of my students ran through, uh, which could be useful for that purpose. And I could, I could share some of the MATLAB code um, that would show how that works. Okay, so I'll be back in a few minutes for those who would like to hold office hours. Thanks very much.